Certainly the most anticipated vice presidential debate in recent history. Thursday's face-off between Senator Joe Biden and Governor Sarah Palin brought few surprises. The two VP picks sparred over the economy, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, the threat posed by Iran and Pakistan, taxes, energy policy, climate change, health care, and the voting records of Senators Obama and McCain. Among their points of agreement was their support for Israel and their opposition to gay marriage. One of the sharpest points of contention between them centered on the role and powers of a vice president. Governor Palin brought up the point and was then questioned about it by moderator Gwen Eiffel of PBS. Of course, we know what a vice president does, and that's not only preside over the Senate, and we'll take that uh, position very seriously also. I'm thankful that the Constitution would allow a, a bit more authority given to the vice president also, if that vice president so chose to exert it in working with the Senate, and uh, making sure that we are supportive of the president's policies, and making sure, too, that our president understands what our strengths are. Governor, you mentioned a moment ago that the Constitution might give the vice president more power mm -hmm. than it has in the past. Do you believe, as Vice President Cheney does, that the executive branch does not hold complete sway over the office of the vice presidency? That is, it is also a member of the legislative branch? Well, our founding fathers were very wise there in allowing through the Constitution much flexibility there in the office of the vice president. And we will do what is best for the American people in tapping into that position and ushering in an agenda that is supportive and cooperative with the president's agenda in that position. Um, yeah, so I, I do uh, agree with him that we have a lot of flexibility in there, and we'll do what we have to do to uh, administer very appropriately the plans that are needed for this nation. And it is my executive experience that is partly to uh, be attributed to my pick as VP with with um, McCain, not only as a governor, but earlier on as a mayor, as an oil and gas regulator, as a business owner. It is those years of experience on an executive level that will be put to good use in the White House also. Vice President Cheney interpretation of the Vice President? Vice President Cheney has been the most dangerous Vice President we've had probably in American history. Uh, he has, he has, the idea he doesn't realize that Article I of the Constitution defines the role of the Vice President of the United States. That's the executive. He works in the executive branch. He should understand that. Everyone should understand that. And the primary role of the Vice President of the United States of America is to support the President of the United States of America, give that President his or her best judgment when sought, and as the Vice President to preside over the Senate only in a time when, in fact, there's a tie vote. The Constitution is explicit. The only authority the Vice President has from a legislative standpoint is the vote. Only when there is a tie vote. He has no authority relative to the Congress. The idea he's part of the legislative branch is a bizarre notion invented by Cheney to aggrandize the power of a unitary executive. And look where it's gotten us. It has been very dangerous. Senator Joe Biden lambasting Vice President Cheney's interpretation of the vice presidency. We'll play more clips from the debate, but first we're joined by two guests who are also running for vice president. They're third-party candidates excluded from the official debates. Matt Gonzalez is the vice presidential candidate for Ralph Nader's independent ticket, San Francisco-based attorney, former president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. In 2003, he ran for mayor of San Francisco on the Green Party ticket, but lost in a very close race to Democrat Gavin Newsom. Matt Gonzalez joins us now from San Francisco. We're also joined on the phone by the Green Party's vice presidential nominee, Rosa Clemente, longtime activist and journalist and former director of the Hip Hop Caucus. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Matt Gonzalez, let's uh, go right to you on that question of the role of the vice president. Well, I would certainly agree with Senator Joe Biden, uh, his interpretation of it. I do think Cheney has been uh, extremely dangerous in the position, and so I wouldn't quarrel with that. Rosa Clemente. I mean, I, I, I would agree with, with the constitutional mandate, but I also think the role, particularly for me, coming out of my generation of a vice president at this time, would be to finally talk about the issues that are affecting particularly black, white, Asian, Native American, and white working class young people in this country. Because neither candidate or most parties in this country have dared to address one of our issues that's affecting us, particularly in the hip-hop generation. 
and and uh, Matt Con uh, Matt Gonzalez, in terms of what you would do as vice president, what you would see as as uh, your role if you were elected. Well, I think the very first thing a vice president does is he. Uh, he or she would preside over the electoral co college count and I think it's an important opportunity to have a dialogue that should have happened eight years ago it should have happened 16 years ago uh, that we need to move to a popular vote and we need uh, elections won by a majority of the voters to uh, you know to improve our democracy um, but I think the, the role of vice president has been disparaged uh, many times in history uh, by uh, those who have held the position because it's often uh, seen as a position of, a, of someone lying in, in wait for a larger office. Uh, it's, not, it's not very clearly defined, uh, notwithstanding what uh, Senator Biden said. Uh, but I, I would caution against what Governor Palin was suggesting, which is that the role somehow has separate authority um, and somehow uh, makes that position a member of that legislative branch. I think that that's going a little too far. Well, let's turn to the financial crisis embroiling Wall Street and the national economy. I want to play excerpts of both nominees' comments on the current financial situation and how Senators McCain and Obama have responded so far. Now, John McCain, thankfully, has been one representing reform. Two years ago, remember, it was John McCain who pushed so hard with the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac reform measures. He sounded that warning bell. People in the Senate with him, his colleagues, didn't want to listen to him and wouldn't go towards that reform that was needed then. I think that the alarm has been heard, though, and there will be that greater oversight, again, thanks to John McCain's bipartisan efforts that he was so instrumental in bringing folks together over this past week, uh, even suspending his own campaign to make sure he was putting obsessive politics aside and putting the country first. Yeah, well, you know, uh, until two weeks ago, it was two Mondays ago, John McCain said at 9 o'clock in the morning that the fundamentals of the economy were strong. Two weeks before that, he said, uh, George, we've made great economic progress under George Bush's policies. 9 o'clock, the economy was strong. 11 o'clock that same day, two Mondays ago, John McCain said that we have an economic crisis. John McCain, in referring to the fundamental of our economy being strong, he was talking to and he was talking about the American workforce, and the American workforce is the greatest in this world with the ingenuity and the work ethic that is just um, in entrenched in our workforce. Two years ago, Barack Obama warned about the subprime mortgage crisis. John McCain said shortly after that in December he was surprised there was a subprime mortgage problem. Uh, John McCain, uh, while Barack Obama was warning about what we had to do, was literally giving an interview to the Wall Street Journal saying that I'm always for cutting regulations. Uh, we let Wall Street run wild. Uh, John McCain, and he's a good man, but John McCain thought that the answer is that tried and true right, right, Republican response, deregulate, deregulate. Uh, that is Senator Biden, Governor Palin, debating the economy. Uh, independent vice presidential candidate Matt Gonzalez, your view of the bailout? Well, I think, first of all, uh, it was one of the things about the debate that I thought was uh, awkward. Uh, I think the Democrats uh, successfully during the debate really placed the blame at the feet of the Republicans, but it's not historically correct. Uh, the Glass-Steagall Act of the, you know, that came out of the first stock market crash of the 20th century uh, has been slowly eroded, and that culminated really in 1999 under President Clinton's administration with a, a law that essentially had at the end bipartisan support, the Graham uh, Leach Bliley Act that allowed, you know, mortgage companies to uh, buy up brokerage firms, to buy up uh, insurance companies, and that's how we have the problem that we have: uh, mortgages uh, repackaged into financial instruments that were quite risky. Um, I also find it ironic. I, I didn't hear Joe Biden ever respond to Governor Palin's remark uh, at one point in the debate, where she pointed out that look. Biden himself had urged uh, uh, or, or spoken about possibly running with McCain and had urged, uh, I think, John Kerry to select McCain as a vice presidential, uh, you know, as a running mate. So I thought that that's that was ironic and we never heard a response to that. And Rosa Clemente, uh, your response to the uh, the economic portion of the debate and the issue of the bailout? Well, I mean, I think um, both uh people up there last night were 
were clear that they don't have the majority of the American people's interests at heart, including the majority of American people that have called into the last week telling the Democrats and the Republicans no bailout. You know, I, I think we, we need to, to talk about the fact that six years ago, groups like Central Brooklyn Partnership or, or, or NEDAP or um, financial liter- literacy groups in, in this country were right in front of this talking about predatory lending. The idea that these lenders could come in, um, confuse people with mass amounts of paperwork, and literally put them into debt for life. But while we're talking about the financial crisis and particularly the subprime mortgage mess, I'm also thinking about affordable housing and how in the same time period there's been a uh, major 